thanks so much for joining for today's session, which is Global Markets Accra, Ghana. Uh, this is a particular honor for me to have with us today, William Senyo, who is uh, the CEO and co-founder of Impact Hub Accra. He also serves as venture partner at Ingressive Capital. Uh, and uh, he's also a board member of Impact Hub New York Metropolitan Area. So he will be able to triangulate uh, various experiences and roles that he has into a spirited discussion about the Accra ecosystem. Uh, William, thank you so much for joining us today. It's uh, such a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, great to, great to be here and um, looking forward to uh, an exciting conversation. Great. So I was wondering if maybe you could start by helping uh, people in the audience understand more about the kinds of work that you're engaged in. Oh, yeah. So over the last seven years, um, for good and for bad, I've dedicated my life to uh, a somewhat challenging endeavor, which is um, supporting early stage ideas to thrive um, in a place that sometimes is not um, fertile grounds uh, for, for ideas to grow. And that means essentially doing whatever it takes to get resources to good people uh, to experiment, grow new ideas, and over time, kind of build viable businesses around them. Um, my, my work here has evolved over the last seven years, as you well know, being um, my partner for, for that period, um, into somewhat of um, an amalgamation of all the experiences we've had, which has led us to, um, to a point where we are focused on building a 20,000 square meter distributed campus um, in the heart of the city in Osu um, to focus on three core communities, creatives, tech entrepreneurs, social activists slash social impact entrepreneurs, uh, who over the last decade have become the true spotlight of uh, this country. Um, if you look across the, 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 the world and the media spotlight and the stories coming out of Ghana, these three communities have dominated uh, the positive um, uh, signaling that Ghana uh, gets on the global um, uh, stage. And it's important for us to build a core infrastructure to support uh, that growth um, in these uh, sectors. So our mission essentially is to build a core infrastructure, live, work, play spaces that kind of elevates these core communities of entrepreneurs uh, and creators. Um, and then also to attract global resources, spotlight them to attract global resources, investment, talent, uh, everything it takes to get the ideas to grow. And um, so far, it's been going good. We just had the opportunity of um, um, opening our most recent building, which takes us to five different spaces in that in the one particular neighborhood and keep growing. And over the next few years, we are hoping to get to up to 20 buildings on the infrastructure side. We continue to build programs and um, access to capital programs to support early stage innovators, small grants, experimental grants, uh, facilitating venture capital investment from our partners from across the world. Um, so that's one part of the uh, of the work. And then a, sm a small uh, part personally that I'm also involved in is acting as a venture partner where for one of the most aggressively growing uh, VC uh, firms in um, Africa called Ingressive Capital. Um, I scout companies um, and invest anywhere between $100,000 and $400,000 uh, with the target to owning at least 10% of the company in the early days and getting them uh, through strategic um, uh, partnerships to grow as rapidly as possible and optimize uh, shareholder value. So it's been an exciting journey, a lot of learning up until this point. And uh, just this year when we were on, when we felt there was uh, a lot of things about to take shape and leap forward, um, this uh, act of God struck and most of us here um, are most at now currently trying to readjust to the new reality and using both our local and global relationships to make sure we make this ecosystem survive given the years of capital and blood and sweat that has gone into making uh, things happen here. It will be a shame to see it all go downhill. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, uh, the last few months have been a work of steadying the ship and um, bringing all hands on deck 
uh, to make um, Accra remain a top destination for talent um, and also uh, a uh, the, the, the beacon of um, hope for innovation on the continent that has been um, to continue to, to, to be the case. Got it. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can maybe give an overview of the ecosystem for uh, people in the audience who might not know very much about the kinds of startups that are coming out of Ghana, what some of the trends are, what are some key industries that uh, entrepreneurs are working in? So, yeah, um, Accra, if you followed anything on the continent, you know, has consistently ranked in uh, at least the top 10 ecosystems to watch uh, in terms of capital, the level of um, uh, talent here, the level of innovation that's coming out of here, the regulatory and government um, uh, policy environment, all the key indicators. We, we rank near the top on all of them. And that's for obvious reasons across the continent. There aren't that many stable economies um, the, with the, the dynamics of um, Ghana uh, to be able to kind of support early stage innovators. So it's a no brainer that Ghana will constantly uh, rank uh, near the top of these indexes. Um, um, but the real uh, granular point of how much innovation there is here, how much startup growth we are seeing and all of that is over, we've seen some of the best growth in the last, I'll say five years. Um, and it's been uh, for a number of reasons. After years of granular hard work of building this massive base of just legitimizing this startup opportunity for the brightest and best in this country, we, it's eventually paid off where there's been a first wave of companies that kind of just doubled, made some mistakes, went back to say corporate jobs and then gained some more experience and came back. Um, and so there's more structure to the ecosystem than say seven years ago when we were in the corner of Akwaje Park trying to um, kind of get hustlers together to dream. Um, and now what we are seeing also that this investment capital so every major fund with its salt focused on Africa has a deal here in Ghana. That is another form of validation for the ecosystem. Um, if you look at our fund, for example, it's literally a mix of Ghanaian and Nigerian companies that form the, uh, the whole fund out of the 11 deals uh, we have. So there's also more capital and the ticket sizes have increased significantly over the last few years. Um, when we started this, it would be a, it would be a, um, 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 a rarity to see anything, uh, uh, any investment of about 50K these days, that is nothing. Uh, we have companies here, uh, based here like M Pharma that have gone on to raise tens of millions of dollars. So the, the, the um, environment obviously is fairly different, but at the same time, it's not Lagos and it's not Nairobi. So there's still uh, a ways out to go. And typically what we think um, is uh, still a problem is the depth of talent across startups. There's still really green entrepreneurs with no prior experience of building and, uh, um, multiple failing companies, which tends to be one of the markets of how matured your ecosystem is. Um, the number of entrepreneurs that are going at it the third or fourth try is always an indication of how far your, your, uh, your ecosystem is. So I'd say we are just about getting to the, that next phase where there's, in, there's been enough failure to drive the next successes. Um, but tip, generally, I think we've seen significant growth in both the depth of the entrepreneurs leading companies, the, uh, the, the spread or the spectrum of uh, solutions, um, and then more importantly, the level of support coming from government, which was never, never the case for a really long time. Uh, today, the central bank has a FinTech innovation office led by someone who comes from our, our side of the aisle, uh, who is now working on the policy side, which means that if you're a company in Ghana today innovating in financial services, you are more likely to get regulatory support in a small sandbox of some sort 
that kind of helps you grow their, their value over time. And all these things show significant growth in the ecosystem um, and shows also the potential growth that could happen over the next few years if we continue on this trajectory. Um, if we consider uh, COVID-19 a blip and not a, a long-term um, factor in the growth. Got it. So I was wondering, so first I, I want to let people in the audience know that if they have questions for William, that they can click on the bottom of their screen uh, if they're on Zoom and uh, ask it and we'll try to answer it at the end of the session. Uh, but William, you just mentioned COVID-19. I'm wondering if you can maybe give us a better perspective as far as how this social innovation ecosystem in Ghana has been faring uh, with the COVID-19 crisis. What's happening? So um, on that matter, I've wavered between fear and panic um, in terms of it's all going downhill to hope depending on the day and depending on the news of which startup is doing what and which company has still managed to raise money in the middle of this crisis. The, the, one of my biggest fears when all of this started was that our ecosystem has a unique um, tendency to display something that a good friend of mine, my Brad Simmons called the zombie startup, which is that the startups could be in a state of just um, uh, not dead and not alive at the same time because of this challenge of um, attracting capital at a very specific time in their growth. So if they are not able to attract that minimal capital, they tend to kind of hover for a while never quite dead and never quite alive. So my fear was that a number of our companies in Ghana were going to get into that phase, which then makes it even more difficult to attract capital because when investors do their due diligence, you are not quite as active to be interesting to them. Um, and so it, it tends to drag the, the deal uh, uh, cycle much further. Um, so one of the biggest impacts that I think this is going to have is that we are going to see a lot more of those zombie startups in the interim as they try to figure out their thing because they are naturally hustlers. They are, most of them are not going to kind of close shop and try to uh, move on. They are going to try to hang on as long as possible to see if they can ride the wave back up when the economic uh, recovery starts. And within that period, their zombie status, the number of those that are going to be in that zombie stat uh, status is going to increase significantly. Now, what does that mean for our ecosystem? Deal flow will likely dip uh, in terms of investors uh, putting capital here for a number of reasons beyond the fact that they will be hedging and also kind of taking things slow. Even if they were interested in companies here, some of the basic metrics will be tougher for the companies to meet uh, because some of them may not necessarily be attracting new uh, revenue or uh, growing customers and um, that may not always uh, be in their favor in the process of due diligence. Then there's also the question of some of the capital that has propped up the Accra ecosystem for good and for bad. For bad is also development capital, development uh, uh, capital from development finance uh, corporations and uh, international development agencies that tend to provide capital that has less strings attached to it which is better for experimentation in the early days. So your GIZs, your uh, French development agencies, your all these um, uh, uh, USAID, all these uh, international development agencies that typically used to work with just um, government agencies were slowly transitioning more and more capital to the startup ecosystem to kind of prop up the ecosystem make the early bets that then VCs and impact investors could follow on. Now, some of that capital will likely dry out as they pull back and re-strategize re, re, uh, how to optimize their, uh, their investment here. Um, and the, the challenge with that is that even earlier, more earlier stage companies are likely to suffer uh, this freeze of sorts. Though in some cases we are seeing more capital and the impact hub uh, in a crisis, one of those cases just uh, getting to start a big, up, a big uh, uh, enterprise support program in partnership with GIZ for early stage ventures. But in some cases, money has been, uh, um, money definitely pulled out of um, the ecosystem 
And then on the other side, talent is going to be even more difficult to attract um, as people re, because one of the best ways startups have in Ghana, particularly have managed to grow, is to attract all these mix of diaspora slash um, American, European people who are looking for new opportunities and to have an impact. And, and typically they will do that when they are sitting on a decent year's worth of savings uh, after working for whatever Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs, whatever, and made a, a ton of money, you, you want to kind of take a, a breather. And most tend to come to Ghana and work with startups and do some amazing work leading business development, writing code and doing these, and also bringing higher levels of standards to the industry here. But all of a sudden, some of them will never, will not necessarily be in the position to do this anymore, or at least temporarily, as they kind of pull back um, and, and focus on their own well-being and getting their financial uh, financials in order. Um, and so, attracting top-level talent at cheap rates, which used to power some of what what was happening here, is also likely going to dry up um, in the short term. Um, and then obviously the last component of it, the media spotlight, which has always driven the interest in Ghana. Uh, if you looked at the most recent Ghanaian um, government um, campaign, um, which was um, year of return, in my view, one of the most um, successful uh, nation branding campaigns in the last two decades, um, um, uh, at least in memory. Um, what it managed to do for the ecosystem here was spectacular. And the fact that we can't have the follow on effect of attracting investment based off of that hype is one of the biggest losses of this whole thing, particularly for Ghana, because we're supposed to have this beyond the return campaign where, okay, now it's not about just learning the history of slavery and all of that. It's now about learning the future of the country and all the opportunities that are here and working with startups and all these uh, different players and investing capital here. Obviously, that momentum is lost and is one of the biggest, uh, I'll say, casualties of, of, of this crisis that we can't, as an ecosystem, leverage that momentum that was created um, by the government. Got it. Uh, actually, so on that note, too, I mean, the year of return was a big deal, and there was a lot of visibility here in, in New York for the year of return as well. And one of the things that really hit home, I think, was the creative industry and how there were all these interesting, like, new creative movements that were coming out of Ghana that resonated really well um, in the U.S. markets and also with U.S. creatives. Uh, I was wondering if maybe you could expand a little bit about uh, the creative industries in Ghana and how that you know is being affected and maybe some opportunities for people in New York to plug into that energy. Yeah, um, and JP, you know this. Um, I, I think the it the, it doesn't get the the support and spotlight it deserves. When we talk about innovation um, on the continent, we tend to focus on technology first, um, which for good reason because globally that's what. The conversation is about, and then second, we talk about social social enterprise or social impact initiatives, things that are trying to change uh, policy or local uh, drive bottom up uh, innovation. But one of the, I think, and the most underrated opportunities on the continent is just culture and creative uh, creative uh, 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 sector. Um, if you look at what has happened um, in the last decade the amount of global pop culture that has been shaped by African creatives is spectacular. Um, um, all the way to pop music. If you look at even the likes of Drake sampling, Whiskey and Burner and all these, the amount of African content that is now globally mainstream, just on the music side, and these days even on the um, 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 kind of uh, film, in film, um, in, in art, general, um, uh, across the board art, it's spectacular the depth of talent locally that can go global with the right systems, the right global connections, the amount of talent sitting here in Accra and the rest of the continent that could really explode. 
is spectacular. And so my thinking is that one of the best things we could do is use that same level of structure and um, learning that has been gained from supporting your traditional tech startups and bringing that kind of rigor to supporting uh, creatives. Because part of the problem is that the, the creative experience itself doesn't sometimes lend itself to the structure that uh, it, uh, it needs to be able to thrive. So bringing that rigor to it, building programs that support these entrepreneurs, connecting them to global platforms, um, and essentially just finding ways to monetize that talent in a much better way could actually kind of energize a whole new community that could, lit that could uh, be a real par uh, parallel force um, uh, in comparison to tech um, as well. So uh, my, my general take right now is to tr try to use the Impact Hub's global platform to do exactly that, a lot of experimentation. And we've started an example with one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the most well-known um, rappers here, Manifest, um, to try to scout talent across the board and reshape uh, what urban pop culture looks like and who gets uh, um, kind of elevated um, um, on both the local stage and on the global stage and using uh, between us two institutions the relationships and linkages we have uh, to spotlight them. And in times like this, it's even more relevant than ever because you can you can share content and you can you can create content from anywhere in the world. Um, and as people, I kind of get more narrow, focused, and uh, don't have too much noise. You can also target better. Um, um, and so, I I I think uh, with all the challenges this brings, one community that could be a big winner with the right support um, framing and structure. Um, is people in the creative industry. And we'll be doing uh, some experiments with um, different players uh, over the next few months. Great, so we have, we have some questions from the audience. So I wanna make sure that we answer some of those while we still have some time here. Uh, first question, from an investment perspective, what's low hanging fruit for a first time investor in Accra in terms of industry, talent, and government support? So, when people, when people ask this question, most of the time, I think the preconceived notion is that it should, it should align with what the rest of the world thinks um, uh, technology should be, um, um, or technology talent should focus on. I tend, even though we work with a lot of your typical startups, over time, my experience has taught me to also look a bit low hanging to your to his point so i am very much these days focused on low tech mass market opportunities they tend to thrive because they could they go to the heart of the uh, needs of most Ghanaians and most west africans so let me give you an example um, these days the types of companies i'll be very interested in looking at for example will be uh, a company that, for example, has found a way to just add a layer of technology to optimize how, say, shipping is done across the region. So if you were to ship something from Accra to Lagos, even though they are close, you'd be amazed at the, the complexity you'll be dealing with. And so someone who manages to make it possible for me to go to a, a platform, key in my location, put my Google Geotag in there, uh, get an estimate based on the weight of what I'm trying to do, and then someone picks it up, and in three, four days, it's in Lagos. I don't need to know all the details of how it's done. I just need to get it in Lagos. Um, it's not your, mo your wildest innovation, but it solves such a pain point that the number of people you could reach is massive. And the same way, it's opening trade corridors for, say, Ghana, China, Ghana, EU, Ghana, US. Uh, and so things like that, a typical example is also across the country, there are so many people using uh, charcoal or firewood still to cook. Uh, a company we recently uh, work with is focused on just building kind of just low tech biodigesters um, that turn organic waste into gas for cooking for uh, peri-urban and rural homes. That is not necessarily your $50 million company, 
but it could easily be a five million dollar uh, uh, company over the next few years um, selling uh, these uh, uh, machine uh, devices across the continent. So I tend to be very much focused on uh, low tech mass market these days. And I think once we develop more capacity there, we can begin to uh, explore even more high tech uh, solutions because I don't think that's necessarily our strongest suit, uh, suit um, as an ecosystem. Um, so to his point, I'll say low tech mass market opportunities are always a, best, a, big, a good bet. Great. And following up on that, actually, the next question is a little bit related. So given the perceived opacity of Ghana market in the West, what tools do you find most helpful for foreign investors in assessing opportunities, as well as for individuals involved in those companies? Uh, to this, I'll say good old fashioned relationships are the only way to get around the opacity. Uh, I don't see any uh, other way yet. I've not seen any really amazing tool specific to the uh, the region here that you can tap into beyond just knowing good people who know their shit. Uh, I constantly am doing some first, first uh, screening for different kinds of funds that are looking for opportunities here. Anywhere from your really large Chinese uh, institutional investors looking to make investment plays here um, uh, to your impact investors trying to uh, uh, put in uh, 50 to 100K, constantly validating whether the people are actually legit, whether the opportunity is real, and whether the regulatory environment is actually right for the opportunity to thrive. Those levels of uh, validation, I don't see any tools being able to do that beyond just in institutional memory and relationships of people on the ground. And there's no way around it, unfortunately. Over time, I think there'll be a form of some platform that does that in a, in a way that can be trusted. But as it stands now, good, knowing good people is just your way around, is the only way around it. Okay, so we have, we have another question. Uh, and then one more question after that, and I think that will probably close out uh, the session. Uh, how do we motivate small and medium organizations and startups to adopt sustainable practices and support impact initiatives and engage in the process? Uh, reviews of sustainability, regulatory reasons are a major driver, uh, but they exist only for large organizations. On this, I'm of two minds. Every time we impose uh, sustainability practices on small um, um, small businesses, it comes at a cost. And there's real costs for trying to go green and uh, um, maintain a certain level of social consciousness, reduce your car carbon footprint and all of that. Most small businesses in Africa have to make those trade-offs of, do I pursue these goals and possibly um, kind of stunt my growth? Or should I grow more rapidly um, and then later try to embed some of these sustainable practices. Our company is a classic example. For years, we've been on diesel generator, which is not necessarily the most ideal form of um, um, uh, generating energy. And it took us, what, four years to get to solar. Uh, but within, that four, within those four years, we could have gone solar, but then the upfront cost would have been really significant and our company would have taken a hit um, at the time. So it's a burden that we have to be careful uh, how we stress it for SMEs because it might actually kill them in the end if we place too much premium on them being green uh, against the potential health of their, of their company. So what I think needs to happen is it needs to, the cost of gold beans adopting sustainable practices should continue to be lowered by multiple players. So one of the best ways for us to go green at the time was to find a player that had de-risked the opportunity significantly. So to build a 10 kilowatt hour solar system, our first installation uh, would have cost us 40,000 euros. But because the opportunity had been de-risked by multiple crowdfunders in Germany we were able to pay $15,000 and get the same value and then spread the rest over seven years. This is a practical way 
that a small business can say, okay, I can do this now because it's been de-risked by other players. So every time we push, especially emerging market SMEs to, to, to adopt sustainable practices, most of the time pushed by impact investors because they need to meet their metrics. They need to understand that it's best if they can provide alternatives that are highly de-risked and uh, uh, have lower costs um, to make it easier for adoption. Um, failing that, you are just uh, uh, stifling uh, the growth of these companies. Got it. So we're, we're almost out of time, but there's just one more question to answer. Uh, what's your exposure to the agribusiness sector? And how do you see this level of investment in tech versus, uh, quote, dirt? I mean, John, obviously, John, John is passionate about um, um, ag, so I, would, uh, I wouldn't expect anything less from him. <laughs> um, but John, to your question, um, more than ever, I'm seeing way more interest in ag uh, from your unlikely investors. So for example, I most recently facilitated um, a small 200K round for a company that's raising uh, about 1.5 million. And they are your typical dirt company, but with a layer of tech on it. Um, and they are building um, kind of decentralized farms um, using crowdfunded resources to kind of reach commercial level farming so they can supply to bigger players like your Unilever's and Nestle. Um, and as a model has worked fantastic. And I'm seeing way, a lot more of those in the industry. So to your question, um, um, I, I think the level of investment in dirt today um, is way more, but I would say the caveat there is that it seems that investors still want a layer of tech on the dirt to make them interested. And so those that manage to find a balance of a mix of um, dirt and tech tend to win. All right, so that's all the time that we have for today. William, uh, true honor to have you on. What a, what a great uh, opportunity to hear your insights. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and to everyone in the audience, uh, you know, please follow us uh, Impact Hub, New York metropolitan area, uh, and Impact Hub Accra, and uh, we'll be hoping to see you on future events. Thanks so much.